بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ویلکم ٹو دا چینل ٹوڈے وی ول ٹاک اباؤٹ اے بینائن ٹیومر آف دا نیزو فیرنگس سو لیٹس اسٹارٹ دس از کالڈ ایز جوبینائل نیزو فرنجیل اینجیو فائبروما اٹ از آلسو کالڈ ایز نیزو فرنجیل فائبروما سو ایز دا نیم انڈیکیٹس دیٹ اٹ از ریلیٹڈ ود نیزو فیرنگس angio means related with the blood vessels so because it is highly vascular tumor so that's why it is called as angiofibroma and the word juvenile indicates that it must be occurring in early adulthood so as we will see that this tumor is more prevalent or more common in teenager groups Nasopharynx is the posterior part of the nasal cavity. You can say nasal cavity is continuous with that one. Pharynx, we know it is divided into nasopharynx, oropharynx and hypopharynx. Nasopharynx is at the top. It is also known as epipharynx. We also call it as postnasal space or retronasal cavity. But most commonly, it is known as nasopharynx. so in today's session we will try to cover the introduction and pathology of this nasopharyngeal angiofibroma it is a benign but still locally aggressive tumor so that's why we can say that it is a intermediate type of tumor but histopathologically this is classified as a benign tumor clinically it is intermediate type of tumor it is non encapsulated and very vasculars it is though a rare tumor but still it is the commonest of all the benign tumors of the nasopharynx it is locally invasive but histologically benign vascular tumor and it is considered as hematoma its exact cause is not known but usually it is seen in adolescent males in second decade that is 7 to 19 years of age and most common age at presentation is 14 years old so it is in teenage group so it is thought to be testosterone dependent when a boy is entering into adulthood so these patients they have hematomatous nidus of vascular tissue which get activated to form angiofibroma when male sex hormone is released in this uh, teenage group as i mentioned it is uncommon but still it is the most common benign tumor of the nasopharynx and extremely vascular tissue only 0.05% of all the head and neck tumors and almost exclusively it is occurring in the males exclusively in the males and age of onset as i told you is the 7 to 19 years but most common age at presentation it is 14 years old from the nasopharynx 10 to 20% of the cases may at the time of the presentation have intracranial extensions and recurrence rate is as high as 50% if whole of the tumor is not surgically excised and it originates from the sphenopalatine foramen as we know that the sphenopalatine foramen is present at the posterior part of the lateral wall of the nasal cavity but still the tumor is considered as a tum benign tumor of the nasopharynx the reason being as we will see in the next few slides that the different theories of its origin at that time the scientists thought that it is originating from the nasopharynx later on with the advent of uh, radiology ct scan and mri and uh, we came to know that actually the site of origin is sphenopalatine foramen so advancements in as i just mentioned in radiology histopathology and endoscopic nasal surgeries Uh, they are particularly very useful 
in understanding the pathophysiology, staging and diagnose juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma than the previous decades. Earliest known documentation of nasopharyngeal angiofibroma is credited to Hippocrates in 4th century BC. The term juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma, it was coined by Shavio in 1906 and Shaheen et al. in 1930, he reported first female case of juvenile nasopharyngeal, nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. But again, I am reiterating, it is exclusively seen in teenage males. So this is the endoscopic view of the uh, nasopharynx. As you can see in the endoscopic view that this is the floor of the nasal cavity. We are for example in the right nasal cavity. Here the nasal cavity is ending and this is the view of the nasopharynx which we are looking at through the endoscope. This is the posterior border of the nasal septum and this slit like opening. This is the opening of the right nasopharyngeal end of the right eustachial tube. And as we know that the eustachial tube opening, it is surrounded by the torus tuberius. So this is the torus tuberus. And just above and behind is the fossa of Rosenmuller, which is the commonest site of origin for nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And this is the vault of a roof of the nasopharynx. So again, this is the same nasal cavity, but here, this is another, this is the patient. This is this was the normal endoscopic view and here you can see again this is the posterior border of the nasal septum this is the floor of the nasal cavity this is the eustachial tube opening here is the fossa of Rosenmuller and this is in the vault you can see a vascular tumor which most probably is the nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. So sphenopalatine foramen as I told you it is present at the posterior part of the lateral nasal cavity and this is the anatomy of this it is formed by the orbital and uh, sphenoidal process of the perpendicular plate of the uh, palatine bone then horizontal ala of the vomer also takes part and then root of the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone so all these they form the sphenopalatine foramen. So it arises from the superior margin of the sphenopalatine foramen and from here the tumor can grow into the nasal cavity, into the nasopharynx. Laterally, it can go into pterygopalatine fossa just behind the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. And more laterally from the pterygopalatine fossa, it can go into pterygomaxillary fossa and from there to infratemporal fossa and even it can come into the cheek in advanced cases. So this is the diagrammatic uh, presentation of the spread of or extent of the tumor. You can say that it arises from the sphenopalatine foramen. This is the nasal cavity. This is the nasopharynx here. This is the anterior end of the nose. So this is in the lateral wall, posterior part of the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. That is the sphenopalatine foramen. So the tumor arises from the superior aspect of this sphenopalatine foramen. From here, it can go into the nasal cavity and the nasopharynx. And on the other side, it can go into the pterygopalatine fossa so that it will become the dumbbell shaped. That one expanded part is there in the nose and nasal cavity and narrow stalk is there through the sphenopalatine foramen and laterally again there is an expanded part of this tumor which is that's why its shape is dumbbell shaped. It spreads submucosally. Medially as I told you it can go into the nasal cavity and nasopharynx and laterally pterygopalatine fossa from the pterygopalatine fossa, it can go into the orbit through this infraorbital fissure and then ultimately into the orbit. More laterally, it can go into the infratemporal fossa. From there above, it can go into the middle cranial fossa and from there, it can come forward into the cheek even in very, very advanced cases. Pterygopalatine fossa, it is a bilateral wedge shaped space located below the orbital apex and behind the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. It communicates with other regions of the skull through various canals and foramina. 
medical student is just a medical student nothing else to do too busy as it is a vascular tumor so it is richly supplied and uh, most commonly it is supplied by the internal maxillary artery which is a branch of external carotid then it can be uh, having a supply from ascending pharyngeal artery or some unnamed branches from the internal carotid and also there can be the branches from the external carotid or even from the common carotid artery. Its exact axiology is not known but there are various theories which include so many theories. So we will go quickly through all these that Ringers he said that it arises from the periosteum of the nasopharyngeal vault. Now from all these theories you will have an idea that why nasopharyngeal angiofibroma was considered to be included in the tumors of the nasopharynx uh, because at that time all these people they thought that it is arising into the nasopharynx because main presentation was there clinically but uh, later on we came to know actually it is arising from the sphenopalatine foramen so same was this gentleman ringers he thought it arises from the periosteum of the nasopharyngeal vault while Som and Nefson they said it is due to the uh, um, inequalities in the growth of skull base bones which were under the hormonal influence that's why it was there in the uh, teenage groups uh, this bench and Ewing they thought that it is from the embryonic fibrocartilage again between basi occiput and basi sphenoid that is again the posterior part of the nasopharynx Brunner he said it is from frangobasilar and buccopharyngeal fascia Osborne said that there are possibility that either there is a hematomatous nidus or there is residual fetal erectile tissue which become hyperactive or to, due to the hormonal influences. That's why it is in teenage group. And this is the theory which is most plausible and commonly accepted nowadays. Then Sternberg's theory was that uh, these are nothing but the hemangiomas, just like anywhere in the body because these are vascular tumors. So these are the hemangiomas of the nasal cavity and skull base. Jirgis and Fahmi, they noted that cells of undifferentiated epithelial cells, so they thought it may be a paragangliomas, but you know paragangliomas cannot be that much uh, uh, vascular. Martin et al, they said it is due to just it is a problem with hormones and it is a deficiency of androgen and overactivity of estrogen. Macroscopically, it is very well-defined, lobulated, spongy, polypidal mass uh, with some nodules and it is covered by the squamous epithelium and as the patient is elder one, so nodularity will increase, its color will vary from its uh, side. Uh, when it is present there in the nose and nasopharynx, it will be pinkish, red to pinkish you can say because it takes its blood supply along with that wherever the extension of the tumor will be. So away from the nose and nasopharynx or away from the sphenopalatine foramen to be very precise, uh, its color will become white or gray as the blood supply will be less or compromised. On section, if we see macroscopically, the tumor looks like reticulated or spongy in appearance and it lacks a true capsule. There is no capsule all around. Its edges are very sharply demarcated from the surrounding tissues. So it is easily distinguishable that where is the limit of the tumor so that during surgical excision, it is very helpful. Microscopically, it consists of only vascular spaces of varying sizes and shape which contains only fibrous stroma with thin walled sinusoids which are lined by the flattened epithelium and there is no muscular coat because there is no muscular coat so if we try to take the biopsy or during surgical removal these vessels cannot contract and when they could not contract the bleeding could not be stopped so that's why these patients usually present with profuse recurrent epistaxis because there are no muscular coat in these blood vessels which are only endothelium lined sinusoids. We will continue with the clinical presentation investigations and treatment in the 
preceding this uh, following uh, uh, videos so if you think it is beneficial for you please subscribe the channel and like and share it with your friends and uh, thank you very much for watching